welcome back to Living History. We're here talking about the life and times of Ted Goldsboro. Thanks, Ted. Welcome Thank back. Thank you. Thank we, you. Uh, we're talking about your parents, and you said that they were married in Oil City, Pennsylvania. How did you guys end up in Narbeth? Okay. How did we end up <laughs> talk, in Narbeth? This is the question. Talk, talk about this picture. Okay. My parents rented on this picture the right half of the twin on Beechwood Lane. This is in 1935, 36, around that time. And how did uh, they, why did they choose Narbeth? My mother from Oil City had come to Drexel. In those days, it was Drexel Institute of Technology. Right. She had majored in home ec and teaching. Dad was a uh, student in architecture and English mm. at the University of Pennsylvania. So I don't know, they met at a party or something. <laughs> And she was seven years younger than my father. So she's just a baby and he's uh, getting, he, he finally got his master's at Penn and by that time she had finished college. So they got married and this is during the depression, 1933. Right. I guess it was hard to find jobs in West Virginia or Oil City. Mm -hmm. So the big city offered a job. My dad didn't go into architecture because the architects couldn't find a job. And they said, Lee, you better find a job that's not gonna be affected by the depression. Right. So he decided he'd go into education and he taught at Valley Forge. And then eventually he got a job at Drexel where his, from which his wife had graduated. Uh -huh. There you go. And talk about this. Yeah, before. in 1937, uh, they had the opportunity to buy number nine Narbrook Park for $10,500, right. as I mentioned. Right. Right. And dad, uh, in 1937, that same year, 36, 37, uh, he got a job at Drexel. So he took the train to work, which was good because you only needed one car. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. This is beautiful. Uh, this is a painting that was done by one of our neighbors named James uh, Blunt Jordan. I think it was James Blunt Jordan, but he went by Blunt Jordan. He was a commercial artist, and as a wedding gift, he painted a picture of our house in number nine, Narbor Park, and gave it to my sister and her husband. Very beautiful. And how about this? Narbor Park is unique in that it's an open space. I think the whole thing's about 12 acres with a stream running through it, and the houses are pretty tight together around the edge. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of the designers was that you don't really need a lot of space in between your houses because you all look out on the open space. Correct, yeah. So we call that common ground. Common ground right. And there's a bridge there. This That's is good. a picture that my father took in the springtime when uh, things were blooming. Um, and he backed, uh, Dad loved to experiment with different cameras and telephoto lenses and wide-angle lenses. So I guess he was experimenting with the camera. Well, he's given you a lot of memories yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, the house had what was called a double lot. I said the houses were close together, but right. there were about three or four houses in Norwalk Park that had two lots. Mm -hmm. And we were really number seven and number nine Norwalk oh. Park. And even when I was growing up, the tulip poplar trees were pretty big and offered quite a bit of mm -hmm. shade. But there's always a danger in having a tree near your house, and that is the branches break. And we had a red tile roof, so when a branch broke and came down, it cost a couple hundred dollars to wow. get the roof fixed. There's a huge tree out in front of the house. Yes. That's the front of the house? Yes, this is, yes. Um, okay. It's kind of awkward. Um, from Narbrook Park, the drive down in Narbrook Park is over on this side. Right. Uh, but the house faced south this way, and uh, she got more light to take a picture. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, that's fancy. Um, we had a neighbor who lived a couple doors up named Mr. Keebler. <laughs> Mr. Keebler uh, had a Model A Ford, a 1934. This is in the 1950s, mm -hmm. so it was a 20-year-old car. And my father loved that Model A, and we'd often hear the engine had a distinctive sound, a chuk, 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 chuk. and we'd be at dinner time, and you'd hear that chuk, 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 chuk. <laughs> and my father'd say, "There goes Mr. Keebler." <laughs> and so when Mr. Keebler died, uh, I think my father tried to be respectful over a day or two, and then he called the son and he said, "Would you be willing to sell the Model A?" And young Fred said, "Well, I couldn't sell it for less than a hundred." And my father said, well, how about 110? 
<laughs> and they said, okay. Really? <laughs> so we got the car for $110 um, and it's sitting next to our house. And it was lucky in a way. I was about, well, let me see, in 1952. I was 13 years old mm -hmm. when my father bought this car. But he let me mess with it, you know, take off the fenders and take the doors apart, Did work on the engine. Uh, I did drive it in the park. Years old. In the park. <laughs> I didn't go out on the main roads. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, who are these uh, people? Well, it's a picture of my sister and me and our dog, our husky dog named Aww. Fluffy. Your sister's and very pretty. Fluffy was nice and soft, and so it's nice to pat Fluffy. You started early. I have in a camera. I think my father had given me a camera. I wanted to be like Dad. Mm -hmm. You know. And we're down in West Virginia at my grandparents' house. Nice. This in, is a newspaper article? Uh, in 1944, my sister had a very serious uh, disease called polio oh, yeah. and uh, infantile paralysis is the real name of it. Not too many people know about it anymore because we get an injo inoculation right, when you're right. a baby. But it was a very serious disease. Oh. It killed lots of people. And they say infantile paralysis, it usually struck younger people mm -hmm. rather than older people. And a lot of people in America got polio. Oh. My sister was, she got it in her upper body, in her shoulders, her neck, her arms. And um, one of the therapies was to swim in warm water, hmm. which we didn't have many municipal pools in Lower Marin at that time. Right. There was one at Baldwin School, but they were using it after school for their people. So as a result, um, people in the Philadelphia area went to a YWCA mm -hmm. in Norristown. And my mother drove, my sister, of course, she, my mother's babysitting me after school. And we took another person in Norbeth called Louise Hoffman. Louise had had polio on her legs. My sister had it in her arms and her neck. And that was just an article speaking about the, the therapies? Yes, it was telling about mm -hmm. Jean Goldsboro's, uh, they called her Jean at that time, we call her Peggy. Uh, it says 10 year old Jean Goldsboro, pictured in the upper right, contracted polio October 10th, 1944, and was stricken so badly that she lost the use of so on and so forth. Oh. But she's had a normal life, she's alive, she's God 80 years her. old, Good. she lives That's in Southern California. That's wonderful. Uh, this is a picture of me and Fluffy and <laughs> Peggy, and we don't know who this young child is. And then a, a girl named Jean Pat McKenzie who lived in Norbeth. Another picture, this is one of the few pictures that I have of most of the kids my age, within a year or two, who lived in Norbert Park at the same time I did. And it's, it's, you know, you lived on Homewood Avenue. Mm -hmm. Were there kids that you could play with mm -hmm. who were about Absolutely, your age? Absolutely, yes. But if you didn't, then you'd just be one or two kids, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't be as much fun. No. So these were the kids that I played with. And, uh -huh. and we There's played a lot football. Of you. <laughs> and yeah, there were a lot of us. And um, most of us stayed living there the whole time. Uh, John Barnes moved back to Penn Valley, and Doug Meal moved out to Chicago. But all the rest of us were there my whole childhood. Wow, how nice is that? <laughs> Stability. The, exactly, yeah. exactly. Talk about this, Matt. Well, uh, Narber School, I wanted you to know where Narber School was. So it was the corner okay. of North Essex and Sabine. Right. It had two buildings, and it had a playground. The playground wasn't too big but it was big enough for our uses for an elementary school. Right, that, and that, so is this, this the this newer? Yeah, this photo was a postcard, shows the two buildings. And the building that's closest to you was built in 1917. Okay. And then the older building is the 1892. Uh, when I was in school, the kindergarten through third grade, K123 was in the 1917 building. And underneath that was a gymnasium. It under, underneath the building? Uh, underneath the building. But they did a pretty, the architects did a pretty smart thing. They put half windows on the, the oh. bottom floor. So even though you were down in the gym, there was it some still natural, natural light. light. Right, uh -huh. right. So talk about this picture up on the playground at Narva School. Okay, we're at Narva School. One of the, well, the, the phys ed teacher named Mr. Weatherall. We didn't have a full-size field, so it was difficult for him. We, we couldn't have a track. We didn't have soccer. It was difficult. What do you do with the kids? Sure. So one of the ideas that he had was, I don't know what you call it. It wasn't <laughs> tumbling, but it was like human pyramids. pyramids. <laughs> and we stood on each other's shoulders, you know, the big kids on the bottom, 
and you kind of held held on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> shaking a little bit. And it was hard getting down because you're way up oh. on top of somebody's shoulders. But it was kind of impressive yes, for, for eighth graders. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Well, uh, I was a Boy Scout, as many of us were in Narbeth. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have Resica Falls, which is up in the Poconos in those days, or at least I wasn't aware of it. So we went to something called Camp Delmont, which was in Green Lane, Pennsylvania. I don't know where Phoenixville. Or mm -hmm. I don't know where it was. <laughs> somewhere, uh, Perky Omen, up that way. And this, these are Narbeth kids. Oh, nice, nice. Oh. Um, my family, on both sides, coincidence, <laughs> were both Episcopalian, uh, mother and father. Uh -huh. So my sister and I were raised in the Episcopal Church, which happens to be All Saints Episcopal at Windwood, uh, in Windwood Road and Gypsy Lane and Montgomery Avenue. Mm -hmm. This is my best friend in my childhood, Don Irvine. His father was the choir master of the choir that he and I sang in. Mm. Okay. Uh, I went to Ardmore Junior High School, and over the door was entered to learn go forth to serve. And many of us who went through the Lower Marion School District remember that, enter to learn, go forth to serve. It had an influence on many of us. These are kids coming out in the 1950s from the front door of Ardmore Junior High School. Okay. This is an aerial view? This is an aerial view of the three schools that were in the complex, the Lower Marion School District complex. There was Lower Marion High School, mm -hmm. Senior High School, which was built 1910 to 1963 for the administration building 1932 and still there. And then Ardmore Junior High School, which was 1924 to about 1989. Oh, so different now. So yes, different. yes. Uh, this is the demolition of Armour Junior High School, which I think was around 1990 or 1989, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Uh, there was a court suit to try and save the school, but today it's where lo the new Lower Marion High School is. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't have been too good unless you were willing to fix up the old school. Right, right. Now, what's this picture of? Well, uh, this is uh, this is unusual. This is out in Chester County. It's of a country store where we used to stop when we were camping. We'd take the Model A Ford and we'd go out and camp in the, in the woods there. <laughs> and uh, this was an old time store and we loved to stop in that store in Eagle, Pennsylvania. Oh. All right, now talk about uh, this Yeah, picture. this is Ted uh, in high school, <laughs> shining my 1938 Ford, uh, 1930 Ford, my Model A. This is the one your dad bought from the neighbor? Yes, the neighbor for $110. <laughs> and, um, Dad had had it repainted, and uh, the, they did a lousy job. It was like a, you know, thirty-five dollar job or something. It didn't work <laughs> out very well. But for a few times, you were able to shine it before the paint came off. <laughs> okay, and there's an article. Well, I was very lucky in that I wasn't much of an athlete, and um, in high school, my dad had said that he had run track. I thought, oh, I'll try it. And I wasn't much good at a sprint, but if you had me long distance, you know, run from here to Balakinwood, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so I ran cross country, which often in those days was running in the streets. It was pretty dangerous. We were competing right, with cars right, and dodging sure. things. Uh, but in my sophomore year, there was a wonderful runner named Sidney Douse and Jay Kirby. And they were so good that we won the districts over in Upper Darby. We ran on a golf course over there in Upper Darby. And then we got to go to the States, and I ran in the snow at State College. Wow, <laughs> how impressive. Now it's time to wrap up. <laughs> well, Ted, thank you so much for coming in and spending time with us. This is going to do it for our Living History special with Ted Goldsboro. We're going to come back and do another show with him. Thanks uh, for watching. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so thank much. You.